In today's lecture, we're really switching gears. We're going to talk about recombinant DNA technology. And there's four things I'd like to talk about today. So I want to talk about recombinant DNA technology itself. I also want to talk about southern blot analysis, northern blot analysis, western blot analysis. These are ways to detect different macromolecules. So we're going to talk about that too. Okay, so what is recombinant DNA technology? Well, really what it is is the ability to connect different pieces of DNA from different sources. Those different sources might be from the same organism, or they might be from different organisms. Why is it useful? Well, it's useful because we can use it in the cloning or copying of specific DNA fragments. We can manipulate genes, right, control gene expression. Uh, we can introduce mutations, see how genes function. Or we can put genes where they weren't before, right, to deliver a desirable um, uh, benefit to a given organism. So really the sky is the limit. Uh, when you do the technique, it doesn't always work, obviously. You might have to try it several times. But really, uh, there's a lot of um, benefits, a lot of variation you can use with this technique. So I want to show you how it works. What's an application of this technique, I guess, before we go into how it works? An application is that uh, this technique has been used to produce human insulin and E. coli to give to individuals who are diabetic. Major benefit. Uh, you know, people with type 1 diabetes don't produce insulin, right? And they have a very hard time regulating their blood sugar. In the past, they had insulin injections, right, uh, which were required to lower their blood sugar, right? Insulin can help process the blood. Uh, the sugar in the blood. Uh, that's still done today, right? But historically, the source for the insulin was pigs, cows, etc. Uh, worked fine, but very expensive to generate the insulin that way. Also, you always have that low risk of having uh, infections or transfer of disease between species. So today what happens is um, we use biotech instead, right, for all these reasons. And so recombinant DNA technology, I'll show you in a second how it's used to produce insulin for humans. Okay, so how do you make a recombinant DNA molecule? Well, in short, and I'll show you a picture in a second, but in short, you isolate the DNA you want, you cut the DNA you want with restriction enzymes, those are molecular scissors, right? So DNA, or excuse me, proteins that cut specific DNA sequences. You cut them, you cut the target sequence or the gene you're interested in, you cut the plasmid, which remember plasmid is a circular piece of DNA uh, that we isolate from bacteria. We cut the plasma with the same restriction enzymes, then we pop them together. And that, that process of putting them together is called ligation. So an en enzyme called DNA ligase will ligate the sequences together. Then you have your recombinant DNA molecule. Okay, so let's look at these enzymes a little more specifically. So we have these restriction enzymes. Uh, they cut DNA at specific locations. Uh, there's a ton of them, but to show you a few. So one is called HIND3. It cuts the sequence here right where the arrows show, right? So you cut and you get this. Another one is called PV2, PVU2. Again, you cut here, you get this. I want to show you the difference here. Sometimes you get cuts that are like this, right? They're called staggered cuts, or they're called sticky ends. These are always preferred, right? Or almost always preferred. Other enzymes produce cuts that are called blunt cuts, like this, where it's just like you're taking an axe and chopping right through the sequence. The reason why the sticky ends are preferred, as opposed to the blunt ends, is that the blunt ends are hard to ligate back together, because you can't get any hydrogen bonding going on there. Uh, here, see how eventually if you put these two back together, this A would slide over here and hydrogen bond with this T. You have some overlap. You have some hydrogen bonding that can occur from the top strand to the bottom strand, where here you can't really get that. So restriction enzymes were discovered uh, in uh, 1973. Uh, formally, they're called restriction endonucleases. Endo meaning they cut within a nucleic acid sequence, right? So in other words, this is within as opposed to chopping at the end here. The opposite would be exonuclease. Exon Greek means outside, so if it did chomp at the end, that would be called exonuclease. And restriction enzymes uh, recognize specific sequences, and the sequences they recognize are called palindromes. I want you to note that, palindromes. Uh, and what I mean by that is a palindrome in English is like the word mom or dad. It's the same forward and backwards, right? Uh, a palindrome in molecular biology is close to that, but not exactly. So when we say palindromes, we don't mean the top sequence is the same forward and backward. We don't mean that, right? Because forward is AAG, backward is TTC. They're not the same thing. We don't mean that, but we mean the top sequence read this way to the right is the same as the bottom sequence read backwards. So you can see AAG, AAG, right? So that's a palindrome. 
Okay, so again, they recognize palindromes. Some leave sticky ends, some leave blunt ends. Uh, this is just a diagram. You don't have to memorize this, but this is just a diagram saying uh, what enzymes, what restriction enzymes come from what microorganisms, what sequences do they cut, what type of ends do they produce. This is what you would see if you looked at a biotech website, something like Promega or New England Biolabs. You can pick your restriction enzyme of choice and cut your DNA sequence, you know, where you will. Uh, obviously, there's some logic to how you pick that, uh, but really the sky's the limit. There's hundreds of enzymes out there that you can use. Okay, so again, what happens? If we want to link these two DNA sequences that were usually not linked, we would digest one with a restriction enzyme, digest the other one with the same restriction enzyme, get these fragments, put them together in a tube, and we ligate them back together. So these enzymes called DNA ligase are used to seal the deal. Uh, we could use one restriction enzyme to link two sequences. Often we use two just to make sure the orientation or the direction of the sequence is correct. Uh, that's something I'll get into later in the lecture. Okay, so whenever we link these enzymes, or excuse me, whenever we link one piece of DNA to a new piece of DNA, we usually insert the gene into something called a plasmid. Whenever you buy a plasmid from a store, it's just sort of your starting point. We call it an empty vector, we call it. So in other words, empty vector is just it's whatever you bought from the company. It's what you're starting with. I want to point this out. So here's our plasmid. There's a part of the plasmid over here called the multiple cloning site. And the multiple cloning site is an area where you have many, many restriction enzymes here that will cut. So again, this is sort of where you're going to put your gene of interest because you have all these options in terms of where you cut the sequence. Uh, every plasmid will also have an ORI or an origin of replication. You need that for the plasmid to replicate, right? So that's essential. And then plasmids will also have things called selectable markers. Uh, selectable markers are DNA sequences that tell you one of two things. So either they tell you, one, uh, did your bacterium later on in this experiment, did it take up the plasmid? It tells you that. And then the second thing it tells you is, did it, or excuse me, it says, the second thing is, did it, um, let me start that again. <laughs> the second thing it says is, what version of the plasmid did it take up? The version you bought from the store or the version that you made? You know, science isn't perfect, right? So you want to take up the version you made, but it could take up the other version if things didn't work perfectly. So the version you bought from the store, again, is called the empty vector. The version you make is called a construct. So once I put a gene in here, I'm going to call it a construct. You might say, what's an example of a selectable marker? Well, the easiest one to say is a gene for antibiotic resistance. In other words, you're going to try to put this plasmid into your bacterium eventually uh, through the act of transformation. And... If your plasmid was taken up by the bacterium, then the bacterium would grow on a plate that has antibiotic because it received a gene that conveys antibiotic resistance. If your bacterium did not take up the plasmid, it won't grow on the plate. So that's one example of a selectable marker. Okay, this is just a review slide making sure you've got you know, all the nuts and bolts written down of recombinant DNA uh, um, production. Let's, let's talk about how we use this in, in reality with our bacteria. So what happens here is once you make your construct, so once it's done, right? So here we have our empty vector. We crack it open. We take our gene of interest. Here it's called foreign DNA. That's our gene of interest. We pop it in. We ligate it. Once we get to this stage, I want to show you what we're going to do. Okay? And I want to show you actually an extra selectable marker too. So, uh, so here one selectable marker is something called AMP-R. That's ampicillin resistance. So if a bacterium got this plasmid, it would be resistant to the antibiotic ampicillin because it has this gene. The other thing uh, is another selectable marker called LAC-Z. And LAC-Z here happens to be right in the restriction site or right in the multiple cloning site. Remember from a previous lecture, right, gene expression 1, LAC-Z is a gene that produces beta-galactosidase. Keep that in mind. Okay. So LAC-Z is put here, and it's put here to be destroyed. Sort of odd, right? So the company puts it here, but to be destroyed. In other words, if you got your gene of interest into the plasmid, you would have put it right in the middle of LAC-Z and disrupted LAC-Z. So basically you destroyed it in a sense, and it can't produce beta-galactosidase. You'll see how that's an important selectable marker in a second. Okay, but once we get our plasmid, our, our construct, once we're done making it, we're going to try to transform it into E. coli cells, into bacterial cells. And what's going to happen is if we can transform it in, then we say the bacterial cells were competent. So we buy special cells from a biotech company that um, are competent cells. They're especially good at taking up DNA. They're very easily transformed. Um, okay, we said that. All right, 
So now what we do is we grow them on a plate that have antibiotic resistance. And this is what we find on the next slide. So don't worry about the colors for a second. But if you see colonies, so all these little dots, whether they're blue or white, they're all colonies. If something's growing on this plate, you know that it got some version of your plasmid, right? Either, now this is what we want to get, right? So either it got your construct, or if it didn't work, it got something still, right? Because it grew, so it got your, your empty vector. How do we know it got one of these? Well, this has resistance to ampicillin. This has resistance to ampicillin, this dark blue part right here. So if it grew, it had to get one of those, right? Because that's the first part, so that's one selectable marker. The second thing is this, and it, take, it takes a little aside story to explain it for a second. But remember, um, LACZ produces beta-galactosidase. Usually that enzyme processes lactose, if you remember that previous lecture. But there's also a compound or a chemical called XGAL. And what XGAL is, is um, XGAL is a compound that when it's cleaved, so it's a lactose analog, right? So if beta-galactosidase doesn't have lactose available, it'll cleave this molecule. When it cleaves it, it makes a blue color just an empirical fact, right? It makes a blue color. So if you're producing beta-galactosidase in your colonies, your colonies will appear blue. Okay, now let's back up to the previous slide. Well, let me say one more thing, then we'll back up. If your colonies are white, you're not producing beta-galactosidase because they're the normal white colony that bacterial colonies are. Okay, so now let's back up. Which one do we want? Well, if they're blue, they're producing beta-galactosidase. If they're producing beta-galactosidase, they have an intact LACZ gene. So think to yourself, does this have our gene of interest in it here? And the answer is no, it does not. So we don't want the blue ones, right? The blue ones are pretty, but it's a sign of failure. It's a sign that our bacteria received the, um, the empty vector. However, if we put our gene of interest in, we're disrupting this LAG-Z gene, we're not going to produce beta-galactosidase, and our colonies will stay white. So you can see that the white ones are actually the ones that we're interested in, because that's the construct that has our gene of interest. And again, this is the exact same process that um, we use to produce human insulin for diabetics. And it's, it's a great revolution in technology that has helped many, many people live very normal lives when before, uh, you know, it was hard to get everyone in the insulin they needed. And uh, individuals with diabetes had uh, many more symptoms uh, than they do today. And if you're interested in reading more about this, you can click on some of these links here. Okay, there's other types of cloning vectors too. So I only focused on plasmids. I don't want to convey that that's the only type. Uh, there's phage lambda, cosmids, there's Bax, there's yaks, there's all types of things. I'm not going to focus on all of those. I'd rather just focus on plasmids today, focus on it well, uh, but know the other ones exist at least, right? There's other options. Uh, but when most people do cloning, really, if you had to pick a coin or flip a coin, you know, they're talking about plasmids. So the one I showed you is the, by far the most common. Okay, let's talk about three other techniques here briefly. So sometimes you want to detect if a given sample has a given DNA sequence. And the technique you would use for that is something called a southern blot. And it's based upon these principles. It's based upon the principles that um, when you have a double-stranded DNA sequence, you can heat it up or change the pH and you can denature it. You can separate those strands. But then if you cool the sample back down, you know, or return the pH to, to native uh, level, then you can renature. The strands will come back together. So strands can denature, come apart. They can renature, come back together. Uh, also, if you have a single-stranded piece of DNA, what you could do is you could take another strand of DNA that has the complementary sequence, and you can hybridize it to it. That allows us to do all these different techniques here that we're going to talk about in a second. Okay, so let's talk about the first one. I'll talk about something called a southern blot. And what a southern blot is, is a southern blot is a technique where we isolate DNA from different sources, we digest it with restriction enzymes, and we run it on a gel. So we separate it by gel electrophoresis. So uh, let's pretend we have, you know, two different samples here, right? We have our DNA. We load it into our gel matrix. Um, the details of the gel we're going to talk about a little bit later in this course in lab. Okay, so keep that in mind in terms of how you pour the gel, what it is exactly. But for now, just think of the gel matrix as it's like a piece of jello, uh, and DNA can wiggle through it. Uh, it's very much like a snake wiggling through a sandbox or something like that. So you load your sample. When you run the gel, the large fragments of DNA move more slowly than the small fragments. You can separate DNA based on size. And then what you do is you get very pretty gels that look like this. For a southern blot, what you do is you, once you do that, you transfer the DNA from a gel to a thin membrane called the nitrocellulose membrane. All this is using uh, you know, electricity. 
And the reason you do it is because you want to get the DNA on a thin surface that you can probe later. Uh, when I talk about probing on the next slide, you can't probe a thick gel, but you can probe a thin membrane. So that's the next thing we're going to do. And this is sort of the key to it. So we transfer the DNA from the gel to the membrane. And then what we're going to do is we're going to incubate it with a radioactive probe. You might say, what is the probe? Well, these little red things are the probe, right? Probes are just DNA sequences you order from biotech companies, or you could make it yourself if your lab has those capabilities. And they're the complementary sequence to the sequence you want to detect. This is very analogous to the technique FISH that we discussed in lecture earlier. So you could see that um, you could see that we have these probes. They're complementary to the DNA sequence we want to detect. So they're only binding, not to all the DNA bands, right, but to only the sequences we want to detect. And then we can see the probe because either it's radioactively labeled traditionally or it could have a fluorescence labeling on it. The final thing we do if we have radioactivity is once our probes have bind to the bound to the specific uh, targets that we're interested in, then uh, we basically expose uh, the radioactive membrane to a film, right? Sort of like photography in a sense. I mean, not exactly, but it's a good way to think of it. And you can see that we actually only see the bands that had the radioactive probe bound to them. And so we can see, does each sample have the sequence that we're interested in because we might have different probes and different experiments? So that's how we detect DNA sequences, right, in gels, DNA sequences. That's telling us if a gene or a DNA sequence is present. There's another technique called a northern blot, and honestly it's almost identical to a southern blot with one very important difference. Northern blots are used to detect RNA sequences. And so this tells you a whole other different level of what's going on. So you want to think to yourself, how does a northern blot differ from a southern blot in the information it gives you? Let's think about it a second. It gives you a very different information. A southern blot tells you is a gene, is a gene present. A northern blot tells you is, it, is a gene being transcribed? Is it doing something? Is RNA being produced from it? Very different information. The final blot I want to talk about today is something called a western blot. And western blots are used to detect proteins. Um, the general principle is the same as, as the southern blot, but with some you know, important differences I want to mention. Um, obviously, we're using proteins instead of DNA, so your probe is now going to be an antibody with either radioactivity or fluorescence on it right, to detect a given protein. The other thing I want to mention is that when you run proteins through a gel, we've got to be careful. We've got to do something with them. Proteins come in all different shapes and sizes. Uh, there's four structural levels, as you know. And so you've got to make sure you're comparing apples to apples. Even if two proteins have the same amino acid length, they might fold very differently, right? And so really, we got to get rid of that extra folding so we could separate proteins from proteins only based on their length, on the number of amino acids. So we're comparing apples and apples. And to do that, we basically use a chemical called SDS. It's like a detergent. And what it does is it relieves all the structural levels of the protein so you only have the primary structure. And it gives the primary structure a uni uniform charge. So now we're comparing amino acid sequences that are straight lines, right? And we're comparing them purely based on size. Very important point. OK. Otherwise, though, the technique is, again, very similar. We run the proteins on the gel. We separate them based on size. We transfer them to a nitrocellulose membrane so we can probe with our probe. And remember, the probe is different here. So it's not DNA with fluorescence or radiation. Now it's a protein, an antibody you know, with fluorescence or radiation. Then finally, we detect our sample, and we see, you know, does each sample have our given protein of interest? So it's a very neat technique. Again, the information in a western blot differs very much from a southern or a northern. So now you're not saying, is the gene there? You're not saying, is the DNA transcri transcribed? But you're saying, is the DNA transcribed, and is it translated? So if you see a western blot, you do assume the gene was there, obviously, right? But it's telling you if, if the gene was expressed all the way to the level of the protein. So it's a very important uh, test at our disposal. OK, here's a summary of today's lecture. So I encourage you just to look these slides over here. Uh, and if you have any questions, please let me know.